Welcome to Asian Times TV, the cutting edge news analysis show from Princeton TV that looks at the issues that concern us between the United States and Asia Pacific region, the fastest growing region in the world. Today, we're going to make a pivot of our own actually. We're going to focus inwards a little bit in the United States. We're going to look at Asian American athletes. We have with us today a very special guest, Neha Obroy. She's a professional tennis player. Uh, she grew up in Princeton, uh, but then trained with her sister, Shika, who's also a tennis player, a uh, USDA ranked tennis player. Welcome to Asian Times TV. Thank you so much. I'm glad you could come in. You're, you're uh, part of Princeton. That's community. right. I grew up right here, right down the street. So tell me about your uh, you know, forays into tennis. Right. Well, uh, I'm one of five girls in the house, and all of us play tennis. We played all the sports growing up. My father put us into every sport you could think of. Uh, we excelled at tennis, so he had decided that to invest uh, time in that. So one of my sisters, Shikha and I, we moved to an academy. At, I was at the age of nine mm -hmm. in Saddlebrook in Tampa, Florida. So we moved there to train. Um, you know, we were living there in the academy, training eight hours a day, uh, being homeschooled, and uh, you know, living together. And then at 16, I. Um, I got into Princeton, so I've completed mm -hmm. my freshman year here before deciding to go on the tour. And I played on the tour for about so six So you kind of like years. the Jeremy Lin phenomenon before Jeremy Lin happened. Right? <laughs> yes, exactly. You, you're an Ivy Leaguer yes. who played professional sports, right. and you excelled at it, right? You were ranked uh, quite high. Yes, I was a, a top 200 in the world, singles, 110 in doubles, and mm -hmm. my sister, top 100. So, um, so what brings you to my show? <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to talk to you about Asian Americans. Why, d why don't we see more uh, on the pro circuit, in the right. college circuit? Right. Um, okay. You know, well, I'm flattered. I mean, I'm flattered to have a professional athlete on my show talking about uh, Asian athletics, which is a, sh a topic we haven't gotten into, but right. obviously we need to get into it. Yes. He, you know, here, so this is really like cutting edge TV we're, we're producing at Princeton TV here. Um, so tell me about the challenges, though. Oh, you said homeschooled. Yes, it five was, girls. It was five and your father motivating you to play at le professional That's sports. That's right. Yeah. yeah, I mean it was a daily grind. You know, we were on the court for seven, eight hours a day. We'd come home exhausted and just hit the books. Being in an Asian American household, mm -hmm. if you didn't get an A, you weren't on the tennis court. Right. So we had to really push ourselves, our bodies, our mm -hmm. minds on a daily basis, and it was tough. Mm -hmm. But I think we have the the legacy of great discipline and we're able to use that right. you know it was very important for my parents um, to set up a plan b for us if our our athletics failed mm -hmm. um, so it was something that we had that was quite unique in that sense that i think a lot of asian american households can relate to excelling in not just one thing but two things or mm -hmm. maybe even three mm -hmm. we have a lot of musicians right. we have you know that go to ivy league schools we have we just want to see more athletes. Right, right. We want Fantastic. to develop that. So, but you, but from a, you were homeschooled, though. You said with your sister, who was also playing, and the yeah. two of you played well, doubles. We did I a think. correspondence program with a private school. Okay. But I, the last two years of high school, w I was homeschooled, and that was very challenging. It was mm -hmm. very, very challenging because I, I didn't have a teacher to teach me. I literally was self-taught, and you know, you're exhausted from hours on the court in the hot sun. So it, it was quite challenging, but. We stuck through it, you know. My parents were able to support that and help me with tutors and things like that. So it was, it was quite nice. So is there something specific about tennis that draws the, you know, because I, I go I go to courts here, right, with yes. my with my kids to several of the courts, Mercer. filled with Chinese and Indians playing, right? It's amazing. You yes. get all, you know, very much like violin, I guess. Yes. You know, violin instruction is heavily now populated with uh, uh, ch Chinese and Indian kids, right. uh, certainly in this area. Um, and you find the same with tennis. Absolutely. What is, what is going on there? Um, you know, I would think that tennis has always been a very popular sport in but both But you should say countries. you're an instructor as well, right? You teach tennis. I do, actually. Yeah. I teach. I have a lot of Asian American students right. that, that come, both Indian and Chinese. I do teach them right here. But uh, I think it's just because it was such a popular sport in our home countries, uh, bringing it over here, it's also a very affluent sport. And okay. 
you know, our immigrant population happens to be a very affluent population, so I think the assimilation process was sort of natural in choosing tennis. So it costs a lot to, to train, it costs a to lot. be homeschooled. You're part of exclusive country clubs and, and you know, being right. homeschooled, it does cost a lot of money. It is something, it's a social status, you know, to be able to play uh, a, a sport that's that expensive at a professional level, definitely. But you do have African American, you know, players as well, right, that, are, that have excelled, have done really well. Yes, Arthur you Ash, do, and then, but in course, terms of volume, you have a lot more Asian American collegiate athletes than you do African American okay. playing tennis. Really? At least in tennis and in golf. Interesting. In other sports, yes. I mean, obviously they're filled in other brackets that I see. we have holes in. Right. right. <laughs> so do you find there's something else going on besides, you know, class and affluence, which may be driving this phenomena and, and wanting to gain entry into sort of the exclusive clubs that Asian Americans are, are you know... Uh, you mean in terms of racket sports? Potentially, we yeah, it's heavily racket, squash. right? Is tennis, table tennis, rackets, uh, and and squash as well. You know, I, I I could say that it could be because you know it's a non-contact sport. Uh, it requires a lot of agility, something that Asian Americans are very natural, have great agility, mm -hmm. eye-hand coordination, and also I think the discipline that's required for racket sports is very alluring. Uh, it's almost like practicing a violin, or you know you keep practicing your forehand stroke mm. over and over and over till you get it right. right, right. I think that discipline um, is a very uh, is a very attractive quality in the sport. Okay. But is there something genetic going on as well? I don't think Which is I, controversial, but yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I don't think I would have a, a claim enough information to, to say that well, we're genetically more prone to racket sports than we are to football uh, or well, basketball. Well, like you said, the agility, you know, with ping pong right. and, and kind of the, the sort of the micro kind of skills that you would need right. uh, to be very good at perception and control and sort of cognitive abilities. Right. Uh, I mean, not, that, not that that's genetic. I'm just right. saying that, you know, there are certain sensory motor abilities that, let's say, um, certain groups are, are better at, whereas, you know, f physically to play football, you right. would have to be a big kid. Right. Just the sheer mass and weight and height and, you know, uh, to play basketball would require for you to be, uh, s you know, 6'5 or taller. Of course, all of their shorter players, don't get me wrong, right. who do well, you know, uh, like uh, the guard for the, the Nets, uh, you know, Jason Kidd was, right. was short compared to other players. Correct. But, but somebody like Jeremy Lin then, um, exceeds beyond expectations, but on sheer press, you know, perseverance in right. some ways, right? Right, absolutely. Yeah, you're right. I mean, we do, we do have that, um, I wouldn't call it a drawback, but we do definitely have different right. strengths as an Asian American community. We're not, we don't develop as fast as uh, our American counterparts do in high school. You know, we're shorter, we're smaller. Um, That's so an interesting point. Say, say, say something more about that, which is you're saying that developmentally, Developmentally, we were yeah. slow. I mean, I remember in the juniors, I was in the 14 and under, and the girls I was playing against were practically women, and I hadn't even started my growth spurt. So it was very challenging for me because, you know, obviously you lose based on physicality, mm -hmm. and it's disheartening, but, you know, you, you have to know that your body is so different than the your American counterparts. Mm -hmm. And you can definitely adjust to that. We spent a lot of hours, my sister and I, in the gym because we knew we were a bit deficient in our overall natural strength. Mm -hmm. Not that we didn't have it, but it was something we needed to work on. My agility was great. My hand coordination was amazing. Mm -hmm. But my strength was something I needed to work on. So I think you need to know that about your bodies. You need to know that at 16, you're not going to look like your, your 16 year old friend. You might be right. six inches shorter. And that's okay. You can still perform, you can still, you can still excel. You can still do well. You just have to know and prepare. Okay, I need to eat a little bit more protein. I need to spend a few more hours in the gym. I need to build my upper body just a bit more. Um, instead of giving up or saying that sport is not for me, uh, which I could have done, my sister could have done. Doctors mm -hmm. told my sister she'd be only 5'2". She's 5'8". Uh, you know, this is an American doctor here, mm -hmm. you know, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Just not knowing that the Asian American body is slow to develop mm -hmm. in general compared to the uh, So now, now of course, it's a science, right? We're talking about, you know, yeah. doctors who specialize in sports medicine, right. psychologists who are there to coach and motivate, yes. physical therapists, you know, everything is 
uh, controlled and can be changed Down to a and science, tweaked. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So, so you're you're suggesting here, you're making news here right now, <laughs> that it's possible to train uh, a generation of Asian American athletes to really excel if they're able to fine tune. Absolutely, their, okay. and especially with our heritage, with the Vedic knowledge, with the Tai Chi that we have, with all of those beautiful like centuries of of such rich athletic history with yoga, with, with Tao, okay, and you're all fast, You're fast forwarding now. So say, what do you mean by Vedic knowledge? Uh, what I'm talking about is yoga. So this okay. practice is now, you know, almost every athlete in the world is practicing that. This is something we've had in our arsenal right. for centuries. Okay. So we can tap into that, into our, what we've learned, what mm -hmm. we know in households generally, mm -hmm. and, and use that energy and that knowledge to create better athletes. Okay, so you're saying relying on kind of traditional healing systems, uh, whether it's meditation, biofeedback. And not just healing, but yeah. also workouts. I mean, if you've ever done a yoga class, right. it's quite rigorous. It's been a few years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to say that, but it's true. It's quite rigorous. You know, we have the upper hand in that way. Okay. In that sense. So in terms of the, f you're saying the flexibility and mind control. Yes, and strength. The agility and strength that comes from... Pra practicing these things. And as a young kid, I practiced right. these things. They were part of my household. So you were actually doing yoga and doing tennis. Oh, absolutely. Uh, we'd tennis. wake up. We'd, we, had, we would do our yoga. We would do our breathing. We'd do meditation. And this is all, all because of your, your father inspiring you? Both my parents, yes. Really? They inspired us. Fantastic. We were very proud of our heritage and we tried to use it the right. best we could. Right, right. Fantastic. Now, in your bio that I quickly glanced, you also said you're a proud Sikh and you founded the first Princeton Sikh S club. Yes, I, I co-founded that on the in campus. two years ago. So speak about that a little bit. What, sure. Um, how was that like? My grandmother is Sikh, so I, you know, I, I definitely uh, would call myself a Sikh American as well. Mm -hmm. um, that was really nice. It was kind of shocking to know that um, the best institution, Princeton University, did not have any Sikh representation in its student body. So we went ahead and created. Even though Ricky Gill graduated from here. Yes, I know exactly. The uh, guy who ran for Congress I think from there the was seventh, only seventh district. That's right in uh, California. But I think he lost. He yeah. did. Yes, yeah. but you know at least he ran. That was nice. Right. right. Uh, so we started a group and we started educating the community, mm -hmm. our Princeton community, who didn't even know what Sikhism was, mm -hmm. and that group has grown from just four of us to now there is about. 10 or 12 members. Now we should point out for our audience though wh why this is relevant is you know Sikhism in the United States is relevant again because partly not to highlight this as, as the only issue but because of the, 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 the massacre that took place in Wisconsin right. Um, right. Uh, which is a horrific act uh, and it has led to among other things sort of a education education right but the reason it may have happened is because of sort of confusion about uh, typing you know, stereotyping or racial profiling of certain Sikh groups says, yes. and confusing, conflating them with uh, Muslims, which is again another sensitive issue. Right. Yes. Uh, absolutely. We can't solve that here, but but that's why this issue is relevant. Uh, and Neha obviously gets full credit for obviously introducing this topic in the Princeton community. Um, uh, and of course, it's an issue that's going to be evolving, right? Because we'll be talking about this uh, moving forward. Right. Uh, we actually had a, a great event based on that. Um, it was Turban Tying Day. We made it Sikh Awareness Day. Mm -hmm. We had uh, over 200 kids come tie a turban on their head. Uh, and we really worked on with the them campus? on the campus okay. and wear it for a day to see what it would feel like, you know, how would people approach them, how, both men and women. Mm -hmm. And the feedback we got was just absolutely incredible. I mean, we thought maybe 10, 15 kids with every classmate of ours came up, tied a turban, talked about their experience, mm -hmm. how it felt, and we, you know, we also worked with the, with the Muslim Students Association as well, so it was mm -hmm. very nice. And what was, their, what was their feedback? What was their response to the experience? The students? The Muslim students in particular. Oh, they were great. They tied turbans with us. I mean, the next day, they did the same thing and when we're, where we wore hijabs for a day. So um, it, it was quite nice. Uh, you know, we're a very open community Wait, wait so you wore, you wore a hijab uh, covering half your face? Uh, just, just my hair. And how was that? Uh, it was interesting. It was a little uncomfortable, but <laughs> it was interesting. Yeah, I was you know? say. Uh, most most uh, women, I would I would think, would find it uncomfortable to say the least. Yeah, it was a little. It was a little restricting in my movement. Yeah. but it definitely um, helped shape my perception. Yeah, I well. interviewed I interviewed somebody who had spent uh, almost five years in Kabul, wow, in Afghanistan as an aid worker, and there, for her to go about publicly, she would she have to cover to herself. Right. 
and she found it restricting oppressive restricting yeah. is putting it mildly I mean it's just, you know it's oppressive you know because where uh, I did the I interview find it oppressive I felt that yeah. I actually felt quite beautiful well the it. interview was in the summertime right and we met in the Princeton it library <laughs> it was hot and everybody was in their knickers and shorts and t-shirts right and tank tops you know, coming in and out of the library and here we're sitting you know uh, she had just come from Kabul right so she was wearing long dresses black um, and she described to me how we take so many things for granted here, which is right. the other side of it. I mean, we the take same could these be said of for granted here. The same could be said of wearing a turban. It might get hot, right? So, right. but we, we that's a sign of faith, uh, wearing our, our mm -hmm. faith. Okay. So, y you know, y take it with a grain of salt. Right. Um, just because men wear it, is it no longer oppressive? You know, if they're wearing turbans. It's hot. It's constricting. Right. Uh, it's tight. Um, right. Is it? Is it oppressive because it's a man doing it? Well, you're not covering her face, though, right? No. I'm talking about oppressive in the sense that women, a woman... Was she covering her face? A woman, yeah, yeah. She would, oh, have to she, cover, she would have to cover part of her face to go out in the bazaar in Kabul. Oh, or, the hijab. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for a woman to wear that, and if she's forced to wear it, uh, yeah. then it, it becomes, uh, you know... I think it's a problem when you don't have personal choice, in my, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think you should have personal choice for for right. things like that, but right. Yeah. So, uh, talk about movies, right? In terms of popular culture, <laughs> where like Bend It Like Beckham, okay, yes, uh, or you know, uh, you know, s some of the other uh, movies that have kind of uh, made it with Asian athlete, young right. Asian athlete, wanting to excel and doing well, right, uh, and, and fighting against societal norms and right. families. Well, in, in terms of in Bend It Like Beckham, it's soccer, it's not tennis. I right. understand. But it is a Punjabi Sikh family. Yes. That's very traditional. Absolutely. That wants to keep the girl at home. Not wear shorts. Right. You know, and her mother honest. is, you know, literally having a heart attack when she <laughs> sneaks out of the house. Right. To join a soccer club. Uh, this is the movie is about ten years old now. I understand right. it's dated a little bit. But what did? You, how was your? I thought it was, was a great reaction, movie. Yeah. I mean, we we definitely could relate to uh, to some th aspects of it with family members in India that had issues. My parents are very progressive. Most Asian Americans are very progressive in that thinking. So when I would come home, I did have some similar remarks that were in the movie. So it was it was really fun to see that, you know, like you're getting dark in the sun and, you know, stay out of it and why are you wearing shorts and, you know, all those kinds of things. So it, it was fun to watch, but I don't think it's completely relevant mm -hmm. in this society. Well, getting dark in the sun, you mean as in my getting My skin tan? color, okay. getting dark. Who will marry you when you're so dark, you know? Okay. Family Which members saying stereotype. things like this, yeah. another stereotype of yeah. being fair, staying out of the sun. Right. Um, it's a very big, you know, sort of post-colonial <laughs> hangover that we yeah, have of yeah. staying white. Why is that, why is that a post-colonial hangover, you think? Because the, the white man was uh, our oppressor for, for mm -hmm. 200 years. At least in India. In no, you India. studied sociology at Princeton, right? That's right. Same, yeah. Same, same. <laughs> I think department as uh, our first lady. Uh, Michelle Obama. That's right. That's right. right. Yeah. So you actually walked to the same kind of department. So you sat in the same I did, desk yes. or table. She had her picture in uh, the office and right. everything. So right. it was really nice. So did you actually study the, the sports and the issue of identity development? Or uh, I, I, I touched on that topic briefly on my uh, senior thesis, which was on uh, professional athletes in transition. What mm -hmm. happens after they retire? Uh, I touched on that topic a little bit, not just in the Asian American community, but globally. You know, what happens depending okay. on your your race, your country of heritage, things like that. So what's the post-colonial hangover? Explain that. <laughs> um, it's a theory, basically, that um, what you're basically doing is uh, anything that's associated with white or Western thought or dress or way of acting mm -hmm. is considered superior to uh, your own Indian mm -hmm. uh, way of acting way of life. So this would apply to Africa as well, right? And to other parts of Absolutely. the world. Absolutely. Anywhere there was colonization, colonization yeah. and not just with British coloni colonizers as the mm -hmm. French and the right. Dutch and things like that. Right. So, you know, Fair and Lovely is a billion dollar industry. There's a, there's a reason behind that that's ingrained in our heads that mm -hmm. we have to be fair to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. That brown skin is not beautiful. That dark skin is not beautiful. Mm -hmm. But here in this country, people are dying for my, my skin color, tanning themselves, getting sick, getting cancer in the sun. So I think it's a, a very funny oxymoron. Right. And now there is no, there's, there's no tax deferment for <laughs> right? going to a, That's right. going to a sun bathing salon. <laughs> the right? Jersey Shore uh, likes that. <laughs> wow. Okay. 
So that that's another Pandora's box, by the way, we could get into. I just opened that, yeah. Um, Sorry. But, but but talk about Title IX, though, women, you know, excelling in tennis, which was another sort of a watershed moment in the United States. I think it was 1971 when Nixon signed Title IX. Uh, Title IX. Yes. And obviously it impacted athletes, you know, that came in the generation after that. Right. Of course, who could forget Billie Jean King playing that, of course, Billie that Jean. long match with... Uh, Bobby Riggs. I'm forgetting the guy's name. Yeah, yeah. Bobby Riggs. Uh, which was, you know, clearly a huge event for, for women's tennis, right? For women in general. Right. Um, I think in the 1970s, you know, she beat him. That just reverberated around the world. Right. For women, women's rights, um, and especially as athletes. And I think it was, if it wasn't for her... I don't know her, why, he, why he took her on in the first place. I mean, he should have known better. But... Uh, well, he was a male chauvinist, right? Right. But talk about women, you know, now is sort of coming of age, even Asian women, for instance, coming of age in tennis. Well, I think Mia Hamm really helped us out with Title IX and, and her soccer sensation growing up. She was a huge role model for me. And I think now it's, you don't even blink, you don't even think, oh, because I'm a woman, I cannot play a sport. There are so many opportunities for us. Mm -hmm. ESPN has a, a whole show, a whole site dedicated to women, ESPNW. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that what we struggle with still is uh, athletic identity and uh, with our bodies and, you know, our muscles sexy, uh, do men watch women's sports mm -hmm. just for sex appeal or for actual athletic prowess? Mm -hmm. We still have a ways to go, but I think we've made huge strides in the last 20 or 30 years where now when you grow up and you're a woman, you don't have to think, oh, I, I can't be a professional athlete. Yes, there are still a lot of sports that we cannot do. For instance, cricket in India, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's a sport that is lagging behind for women when mm -hmm. it's, it's so popular. But I think right. globally, it shouldn't really matter if you're a man okay. or a woman. So who are some of the uh, up-and-coming names? You provided me some names, right? Uh, you said Brandon I, Chillar in I give you a couple Indiana of names. Fell? Yes. Uh, I think he's half Indian. Okay. I'm not completely sure. Okay. But I give you a couple of names of uh, Asian Americans in sport right, right. now. Uh, and, you know, trying to pick people who are, are not just in tennis or... Right, right, right. Across Golf. the board, yeah. Yes, across the board. Right. Hopefully we'll see more names okay. soon. Okay. So Rajiv Ram, of course, is I've seen him play yes, at the good US friend Open. Of mine. Yes. He's he's very he's, he's ranked I think in the top hundred or something. Yes, I think uh, he's around as a double around as there. well as an individual player. Exactly. Um Mohini Bhardwaj is, is the a gymnast. gymnast. Yes. Yeah. Manny Malhotra, I don't know who that is. Who is that? Uh, I think that was a cyclist. Okay. Yes. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Alexi Greval in in cycling? Uh, no, sorry. Manny Malhotra is a hockey player. He is plays in Canada. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. And they actually recently had a, uh, a movie come out in Canada uh, where Russell Peters was in it uh, about a sick hockey team. This is a Bollywood movie, though. No, it's actually a Canadian film. It's a Canadian film. movie. Okay, yes. what is it? Canadian be? film. I haven't seen uh, that. The name of the movie is... Uh, oh, I forgot the name anyway, of the movie. Anyway, so who's, who's Raj Bhavsar? Or Bhavasar? Raj Bhavsar, he's a gymnast. And he's actually... Uh, now with the Cirque du Soleil. Yeah. Wow, fantastic. Yeah, very interesting. So Jeremy Lin, obviously, you know, the sensation, the cause celeb. Yes. Um, it, you know, analyze this story for me from your perspective, given you played professional athletics. Now, we're looking at it as, you know, couch potatoes or, or lay people <laughs> sitting back and getting inspired. And, you know, and of course, his jersey selling out. I think he's um, the perfect... I think he's the perfect role model for okay. Asian Americans okay. because we are so, um, we're so conscious and really careful about academics and the mm -hmm. fact that he went to Harvard just you know, covers everything completely, that you can be a professional athlete. And he comes from a very affluent section of uh, Palo Alto, Palo Alto right. Right? Yes. Uh, goes to a very elite high school as well or, or pretty went decent to, high school yes. uh, and then um, grows up watching Michael Jordan inspired by him, you know, does good in studies because his parents say you have to, you know, go right. to... Uh, but, you know, he, he, they, they at least support him not yeah. to be another doctor or an engineer or a, law a lawyer and to take some risk right. and to do things that are outside the mold. But he's on the bench for, for many seasons, right? He doesn't get a lot of play time. Yeah, well, that's unfortunately how sports work. You know, you, have, you, you don't always make it and sometimes you have to just keep pushing and pushing mm -hmm. and pushing and he didn't give up uh, he didn't say okay you know what I had a Harvard degree let me pack it in I can get any job right 
I want. He he kept trying for it, and I think right. that's why he's our a hero for the Asian American community. Right. And I've I've read the recent GQ interview where he says how you know if he hadn't now seen playtime like serious playtime he was uh, would have gone overseas right to play in the, in the European league and right. then retire, which I would have been quite a loss, right? It would have. And I think what's also nice is that we forget there's a lot of support, um, comparatively. In, in America for sports. Mm -hmm. uh, in India, in China now it's booming. In India it's still very slow. Had he been a Chinese athlete or an Indian athlete, he would have probably given up much earlier. Mm -hmm. But because America is embraces sports and sports people so much, uh, he, I think he had the, the dream and it, it kept him alive, the hope to keep trying and keep trying. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Now talk about the, the kind of, you know, sort of the Asian American lifestyle also carries a kind of a special diet, right? Yes. That we get obviously generationally through our parents. Yes. So for instance, we know among in South, South Asians, uh, the cholesterol level is very high because of all the oils we take in. All the uh, oils, the carbs. For, the, for yes. the Chinese Americans, there's a lot of carbohydrates, rice. Rice, yes. Uh, that's heavily consumed. Right. So how does diet, you know, fit into this whole profiling of wanting to be an athlete? I think uh, it's a very important question. I think it's something that uh, all households who want healthy children, who want athletic children, have to stop and take a look at. What am I feeding my kids? Our diets are actually extremely healthy. However, with time, we've put more oil, more salt, more sugar into our food, and it's um, degrading the content, you know, what, what, what we're eating. So I think it's really important that we go back sort of to how we used to eat centuries ago because mm -hmm. we have a lot you know the, the benefits of green tea the benefits of turmeric we, we know mm -hmm. all those things mm -hmm. but uh, instead of frying food you know we need to start baking so it. what were you eating when you were training was there something uh, particular you're eating you from know, their Indian diet I was very lucky my, my parents were extremely conscious of what they were giving me you know um, making sure things were baked not fried I, since Did you eat a lot of vegetables kid, all the time? A lot of vegetables. You don't need to be a meat eater. Not to fried be a vegetables, athlete. but like raw. No, but. vegetables, right. cooked dal, a lot of lentil that's very high right. in protein. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't, what I'm saying is you don't have to be a, a meat eater. So, right, so, but can you be a vegetarian? I mean, the, the, you know, the Absolutely. cultural stereotype that's made, that's still around in India, uh, and it's in the Gita as well, I think. I think Vivekananda said at one point uh, in one of his lectures that. What India needed, this is of course hundreds of years ago during mm -hmm. the time of independence struggle, that what India needed was Bhagavad Gita and beef. Mm. Um, as in, as in the, the symbolism being that I mean, India needed of course high values, but also physical strength. Right. Okay. You know, it's, that's so funny that you say that because we have uh, some of the world's top athletes like Novak Djokovic, completely vegetarian now. Martina Navratilova is completely vegetarian. Okay. So uh, I have young, a young African-American kid whose uh, mother is a yoga instructor and he's completely vegetarian. And there's nothing weak or feeble about him. Right. Uh, I think that notion is again <laughs> something right, right, that right. has just it's been... A, it's a cultural hangover. <laughs> passed um, on to us. From the colonial, so that's changing, uh, you're saying athletics as well in, in the sense what Americans are consuming, American athletes. Not just what they're consuming, but what yeah. they're doing. You know, right. They're also doing Asian, Asian practices you know, before they get on the court. Deep breathing, meditation, yoga, they, these are part of their daily, mm -hmm. their daily routines. Right. Um, and I think that a lot of us Asian Americans are not even doing. So it's something to keep an eye out for that we don't have to wait for our counterparts to do it. We can do it now. We have more knowledge, more resources, better nutrition with Ayurveda to excel in everything we do. Right, right. So uh, in the end, we just have a couple more minutes. Uh, Say something about your show. You're actually starting a show on Princeton TV on this topic. Right. Uh, so this is a nice plug for Neha's show. <laughs> those those of you who are interested in um, you know using fitness and kind of innovative Asian methods uh, on how to be better athletes, better human beings, more conscious human beings, uh, they should tune into your show. What is your show? Yes, when is it going to be on? Yes, it's Fitness with Neha. It actually aired this morning at 9 a.m., but Perfect. it'll be on all this week. It's based off of my website, which is nehaoberoy.com. We talk about right. lifestyle and personal development and how to just be a better, live your best life, really. Fantastic. So with that, we'd like to close this show. Tune in again for another cutting-edge show from Asian Times TV. Thank you for joining us.